and so on. There are many billion, trillion examples of them. Think of many yourself, I'm sure. Okay, so there'll be many examples I'm going to be sharing in here. Okay, uh, from this cultural tradition. Uh, they refer to this as well. My apologies, I'm going to have to read it to you. Uh, it's better uh, probably if it's not standing and reading it to you that way. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, uh, especially for older users like myself, standing up stationary pretty much in one spot for a couple hours is awful draggy wear and tear on my entire old legs. My apologies uh, that it's, it'd be better if I wasn't have to hunch over and, and have to wear the stupid glasses on top of my apologies for that as well. Ancient folks wouldn't wear any stupid glasses about it. You can cope with it. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, also, just little old me, you know, I've not been trained as, a, as, as any uh, professional, as it would have been in ancient times. No, I don't mean professional in a bad way, I mean the good way. They would have been trained in skills and abilities and talents of how to do all, all this, how to share this sort of uh, stuff in a meaningful kind of way. That's what was lost for many thousands of years, uh, as uh, when we get to uh, my commentary will explain. Uh, the story's not been known uh, here in uh, Western lands uh, up until the later 1800s. At all. At all. Even as a rumor. Even as a rumor. It's a surprise when folks begin to discover amongst the tablet records, which are usually, the tablet records are usually of uh, uh, monetary things or uh, numbers of things. They were like collections of, of memories of uh, accounts. <laughs> But amongst them were also things of writing, that we think of as writing. You know, most of those are uh, poems to uh, deities, namely the goddess, but also uh, fragments of secular literature. And this is, this is what eventually becomes the story of Gilgamesh. So I'll read that to you, okay? Uh, in the version, uh, pretty much that Zinleki um, uh, Unini put together, okay, but I've I've worked with the uh, translations, all secondary translations. I don't read the ancient languages myself, okay? This version was put together by myself and officially Mark Thompson for a book we were going to do on uh, Gilgamesh that was going to feature this translation version of it that I'm now going to read to you. And then my commentary, my more or less Jungian, basically Jungian uh, gay commentary on, on the story. And then he's had written, but I still have it, a long introduction, longer than my commentary and the actual story put together. <laughs> but he has recycled that, uh, as he put it, at the time. Uh, and we decided not to go ahead with the publishing. So this is all uh, this be part of it. <clears throat> uh, I'll share it with you. Here is the story of Gilgamesh and Enkidu. First, there's a prologue. I imagine the singer sings out a prologue. Uh, proclaiming the deeds of the king. The one who saw the abyss, I will make the land know. Of him who knew all, let me tell the whole story. As the Lord of Wisdoms, it was commonly in these rituals of the time of Sin Lake Unini, Gilgamesh was called the Lord of Wisdom. As the Lord of Wisdom, he who knew everything, Gilgamesh, who saw things secret, opened the place hidden, and carried back word of the time before the flood. He traveled the road, exhausted in pain, and cut his works into a stone tablet. He ordered built the walls of Europe of the sheepfold and the walls of Holy Inanna, stainless sanctuary. Observe its walls, whose upper hem is like bronze. Behold its inner wall, which no work can equal. Ascend the walls of Europe, walk around the top, inspect the base, view the brickwork. It is not the very core made of oven fired brick. As for its foundation, was it not laid down by the seven sages? Find the copper tablet box. Slip loose the ring bolt made of bronze. Open the mouth to its secrets. Draw out the tablet of lapis lazuli and read it aloud. How Gilgamesh endured everything harsh. Gilgamesh, dazzling, sublime. Opener of the mountain passes. He crossed the ocean, the wide sea, to where Shamesh rises, scouted the world regions, the one who seeks life, forcing his way to Utnapishtim, the remote one, 
the man who restored life or the flood and destroyed it, peopling the earth. Is there a king like him anywhere? Who, like Gilgamesh, can boast, I am the king? The confrontation at the gate. Long ago in the great city of Europe, a man named Gilgamesh became king. Born two-thirds divine and one-third human, he was the son of the warrior king Lugalbanda and the goddess Ninsun. Young, intelligent, handsome, big, muscular, Gilgamesh was magnificent to behold. At first, the new king's rule was good. He fulfilled his sacred role as high priest with majesty. He repaired the city's tall walls and grand temple, dug wide canals to irrigate the surrounding land. Yet gradually his rule changed, for despite all his beneficent deeds, Gilgamesh lacked a sense of purpose in life. With growing frustration, the king began to neglect his ritual duties. He grew arrogant and then profligate, brawling among the men and taking advantage of the women. Gilgamesh had become a tyrant. Finally, the people could bear it no longer and appealed to the gods for mercy. Anu, god of the sky, heard their cries and spoke to Aruru, the goddess of creation, quote, you who made humanity make now a mirror image of Gilgamesh. Let them be equal and face one another so that Europe may have peace, unquote. Aruru listened carefully. She imagined a picture of Anu in her heart, pinched off some clay, then put Anu's image into it. She threw the clay into the wilderness, and out of it fashioned the wild man Enkidu, big and hairy as a bull. At first, Enkidu was innocent of all things human. He ran in the forest with the gazelles. He ate grass with them and drank at the water hole with all the other animals. But one day, a hunter saw Enkidu tearing up his traps. The hunter was terrified, for the primitive man was awesome to behold. The hunter saw Enkidu at the water hole the next day, and again on the day after that. Then fear overwhelmed him, and he was deeply troubled. He ran to his father, quote, a demon man has come down from the hills, cried the hunter to his father. Uh, he has incredible strength, like a shooting star of the god Anu. I'm frightened of him, and I can't go near, unquote. The old man listened carefully, and then advised him to seek out Gilgamesh in distant Europe. Quote, he's the most powerful in all the land, unquote. The elder said, quote, he too has great strength. Go, make your way to Europe, unquote. You can't do that now, you can't just walk up to the president, but you could do this back then, believe it or not, if you just were, seemed significant enough just by your bearing to get there, for whatever reason, that significance came. The old man, okay, so taking his father's advice, the hunter was quickly on his way. Soon he reached the city, and he entered the audience hall of the royal palace, and approached the throne where Gilgamesh grandly sat. The, her, the king heard out the hunter's tale, and then sent him to the temple of Ishtar for a love priestess to return with him to the forest. So the hunter brought the priestess to the water hole, where they patiently waited. On the evening of the third day, the animals appeared. The wild man was among them. Seeing Enkidu, the hunter urged the priest to strip off all her clothes and stuff Hoochie Coochie, I'm sorry, <laughs> into the open. <laughs> I want to encourage you to picture this bizarre scene, which was a really bizarre scene. Uh, go in the open. Ishtar's servant, who was not shy, did uh, exactly as the hunter asked. Intrigued by the sight of her, the first person he had ever seen, Enkidu left the herd and came near. The priestess beckoned him to come closer, and when he did, she embraced him. I mean, em embraced him. He wouldn't get able to run away from that bitch if he had a, a jackhammer and he's trying to screw her off. And he's, he's, She's gone. Okay, embrace him. You got the idea. Uh, you, he's being forced into something that he's been seduced. Okay, embrace him. Enkidu made love with her for six days and seven nights until he was exhausted. She made sure to exhaust him. <laughs> In case uh, yeah, you're not getting the point. <laughs> 
<laughs> on the seventh day, uh, uh, she released him. Uh, and Enkidu went back to the other animals, but they all fled when he approached. <laughs> For Enkidu now had the thoughts of a man. He knew words and he could speak. He possessed a human identity. Now Enkidu knew his name. Then the priestess brought him to the shepherd's house, and there she taught him the ways of civilized people, how to eat human food. It would be an interesting movie, huh? how to eat human food and drink wine and dress his hair and his beard and wear clothing. She also told him about the gleaming city, Europe, where in the great market there was a celebration every day and of its mighty king who lorded over the people like a tyrant. Mm, Enkidu felt a deep yearning when he heard these words about the city. But a powerful anger rose up in his chest on learning about Gilgamesh. Quote, I will call out to him, Enkidu passionately cried out, I will go to Europe and proclaim strength and courage belongs to me. I am the one who changes history. Unquote. After hearing this challenge, the priestess urged him on. Well, she's really angry proposing that Enkidu come with her right then to Europe. Quote, I'll show you, Gilgamesh, the joy woe man, she promised. Quote, admire him, for he is beautiful. His whole body shines with a sexual glow. <laughs> Yet, she warned, he is stronger than you. <laughs> So, you got your butt all ready, <laughs> <laughs> The priestess halted for a moment, gazing into Enkidu's eyes. Quote, In Europe, you will embrace Gilgamesh like a wife. You will love him like yourself, unquote, she finally told him. That night, in faraway Europe, the king had two Rising very early the next morning, he rushed quickly to his mother, the wise Nimson, in her temple, and told the dreams to her. Quote, there was a star from heaven, he explained, and it fell on me. I tried to lift it, but it was way too much. The people all came around, and they worshipped the star. It looked like a man, and then I myself hugged him like a wife. Finally, I picked him up and brought him here at your feet, and you compared him to me." Unquote. Ninsen contemplated the dream in silence for a while, then signaled to hear the other. An um, axe, also shaped like a man, had similarly fallen over Europe. Quote, I embraced him, said Gilgamesh, then laid him down at your feet so that again you compared him to me. Unquote. After relating these two dreams, the king sat quietly at his mother's feet. Then Ninsen did interpret their meanings. Quote, the axe you saw is a real man, she said. Quote, you loved him and hugged him like a wife, and I treated him as your equal. Now go search for him, for he is the powerful friend and can save you. Strength and virtue belong to him, unquote. Soon after this, once again, reckless and not thinking of his dreams at all, Gilgamesh went to the home of a new bride to have her before the groom. So, uh, excuse me for interrupting again, but obviously we are in a world that's not about whether people are gay or straight. So, you see, that's not, I'm not relating it in that kind of, it's about the desires, forms of desire, desire itself. Soon after, once again, reckless and not thinking of his dreams at all, Gilgamesh went to the home of a new bride to have her before the groom. But as he came to the threshold, the great bull-like man, a stranger, stepped between the posts and walked away. It was mighty Enkidu who had come to Europe to challenge the kings and justices. The people quickly gathered around. Quote, a hero has come for men of decency. Unquote, they cried. An equal has arrived a match even for Gilgamesh the godlike. The lord of York seized this bold stranger in his hands. But Enkidu was as strong as Gilgamesh and pushed the king away. The king was startled. And he paused in consternation. No one had ever opposed him like this. And then wild rage engorged him, and with a mighty bellow, Gilgamesh rushed forward. Their bodies crashed together and locked like raging bulls by the 
horns, the two men grappled in the doorway. They broke the doorposts and shook the whole house.